What can hypnosis actually do? Ever since Frank Mesmer first invented mesmerism back in the 1700s, people have been fascinated by hypnosis. It seemingly gives the hypnotist power over other people, shaping their behaviors, even perceptions, based purely on suggestion. And so far, there have been thousands of studies, really good scientific studies, looking at the power of hypnosis, and yet still, it remains a mystery to most people. So what exactly is hypnosis? It's actually really hard to tell. The word hypnosis means to sleep, but hypnosis doesn't seem like actual sleep-like brain activity. For example, if you're looking at brain waves, you can tell if people are asleep and even what stage of sleep they are based on their neuronal activity. But when someone's hypnotized, they show brainwave states similar to someone who's just simply relaxed. And there's no other really good way to tell if someone is hypnotized or not. And this difficulty in measuring hypnosis has made it notoriously difficult to study scientifically. One thing scientists need is objective observations, and it's really hard to tell objectively if someone is even hypnotized or not. So this begs the question then, is hypnotism even a real phenomenon? Or is it simply people faking or acting like they're hypnotized? This is best answered by the things that hypnotized people can do, which in some cases would be extremely difficult to fake. One of the most impressive powers of hypnotism is in relieving pain, or even eliminating it altogether. There are some cases where people are even able to undergo surgery without any kind of medication, just while under hypnosis. Now that's rare, but there are many good studies showing that for the average person, it can greatly lessen pain. For instance, people coming out of surgery who undergo hypnotic treatments need less pain medication and actually heal more quickly. Breast cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy or radiation report that hypnosis helps them deal with their pain and nausea, and women giving birth report less pain while under hypnosis. There's been some really large-scale meta-analyses on this, in which they looked at hundreds of individual studies, and they in general find that about 75% of people benefit from hypnosis in terms of pain management. This ability of hypnosis to alleviate or even eliminate pain seems to be in its ability to distract, to focus attention on one object. In this case, usually a hypnotist will direct a person's attention on a part of the body that's not in pain, like for example the forehead, and then direct them to feel sensations that are pleasant and relaxing, like a warmth and a slight pressure. This, in effect, distracts someone away from their pain, and in fact, brain scan studies show that by doing this, it deactivates activity in the somatosensory cortex related with pain sensations. So while hypnosis seems to be a great treatment for pain, it doesn't seem to be good for a whole lot else. There's been many studies looking at whether hypnosis can help people stop smoking, or stop overeating, or in some other way stop some negative behavior, and the results have been mixed at best. For example, when studies look at smoking cessation, they find that those who go through hypnotic treatment do a little bit better than those who receive no treatment at all, but they actually do worse than many other behavioral treatment programs, such as slowly eliminating the amount of cigarettes a person can smoke each day. Likewise, a recent large meta-analysis looking at almost 700 different studies found that hypnosis didn't have any positive effects in treating generalized anxiety, PTSD, OCD, or even just test anxiety. Similar studies have found that hypnosis is not generally beneficial for other people with other types of mental disorders. It might actually be dangerous for people with schizophrenia or dissociative type disorders. These results are a bit disappointing, but they make sense given that hypnosis is primarily a tool of distraction, which is great for distracting someone away from their pain or discomfort or nausea, but doesn't really change habitual addictive behaviors or treat serious mental illness. Another limitation of hypnosis is that it seems to not affect at all about 25% of the population. So why is it that about a quarter of people simply cannot seem to be hypnotized? We're not sure yet, but we know that the degree to which someone is hypnotizable is highly heritable. and seems to have to do with the way the brain is basically wired. One predictor of whether or not someone is highly hypnotizable is how vivid their imagination normally is, and how often they are stuck or absorbed in daydreams. People who are so-called fantasizers tend to daydream throughout much of the day and often have a hard time telling their fantasies from reality. Another kind of fun test to tell if you would be hypnotizable is to do a little trick with your eyes. Try this. Slowly roll your eyeballs up while letting your eyelids drift down simultaneously. If you find it easy to do, you're probably someone who is hypnotizable. If you don't, probably not. One of hypnosis's more controversial aspects is whether it can be used to recall what's called repressed memories. 
This comes from this old Freudian idea that if something happens that's really traumatic, the mind or psyche might repress memories of it in order to save the person from having to experience it again and again. Like I said, this is an old idea and hasn't really been scientifically verified. And in fact, there really are very few cases of this to be found. But throughout the early 1900s up until about the 1980s, it was very common for psychologists and especially psychiatrists who come from the Freudian background to use hypnosis to try to dredge up these repressed memories. However, after decades of doing this, scientists and psychologists started to wonder if these memories that were being dredged up during hypnosis were actually real or simply imaginary. And by the 1980s, the stakes couldn't be higher. By this point, the courts and police systems had started using hypnosis to get interrogations and eyewitness testimony. So actual hypnotic suggested memory recall was being used as an evidence in court trials. In fact, people were being sent to prison on murder and rape charges based on eyewitness testimony that was recalled while under hypnosis. So at this point, scientists started doing some basic experiments to see if hypnosis really did increase memory recall. And their findings are a resounding no. In fact, what hypnosis tends to do is actually alter people's memories while making them more confident that their memories are accurate. So for example, in one study, they had people look at videotapes of a crime. In this case, a man who mugged another person, and this man in the videotape was wearing a bright red shirt. Afterward, they would ask people why they were either hypnotized or not hypnotized what color the man's shirt was. What they found was that people's memories of the man's shirt were no more accurate while they were under hypnosis. But in a condition where the scientist would say, do you remember the man wearing a green t-shirt, offering that suggestion, they found that those who were hypnotized were much more likely to inaccurately report that the man had in fact been wearing a green t-shirt. And in fact, they were no less confident when giving this inaccurate information than when they were actually giving accurate information. This is because hypnosis can create a vivid imagined event that can seem more real than genuine memories. Given these results, in 1985, the American Medical Association put out a recommendation that hypnotism not be used as part of psychological treatment, especially involving memory repression, and especially not in court trials or police investigations. Eventually, Canada, the UK, and Australia banned the use of hypnotic suggestion as part of evidence in court trials. But the US has still yet to do this. In fact, just a few years ago, a man was convicted in Maine just based on eyewitness testimony that was cultivated through hypnosis. This almost happened again in 2015, except Project Innocence, which is this great organization that looks out for the welfare of defendants, intervened and made sure that the judge didn't include it as evidence. One way in which this field is moving forward is in the development of computerized hypnotism treatments. That way people in hospitals don't have to hire a hypnotist, they can simply log into a website, pop in some headphones, and enjoy hypnotic treatments to try to alleviate their pain, discomfort, or nausea. This would be especially helpful for people who are impoverished, uninsured, or living in areas where they can't find an actual hypnotist. And these computerized hypnotism programs are likely to provide scientists with lots more data to look at. And this will hopefully uncover further the mysteries of hypnosis.